Here is the chapter 4 about non-ferrodaic processes. Non-ferrodaic processes are capacitive processes based on electric double layer formation. Um, let me start with the comparison between ferrodaic versus non-ferrodaic processes. Ferrodaic process or ferrodaic reaction um, is about the reduction reaction or oxidation reaction. Here is your electrode and electrolyte. Of course, you could find the electroactive species in electrolyte side. Oxidized species could get some electron from the electrode, then finally going to the reduced species. Where sometimes reduced species would lose its own electrons into electrode, then finally going to the oxidized species. That is the Faraday process or Faraday reactions. What is the most important characteristics of Faraday process or Faraday reactions? Electron should pass the interface between the electrode and electrolyte or between the electrode and electroactive species. So, electron should pass the interface. <coughs> so, in, uh, in the other words, charge transfer or electron transfer happens through the interface. This Faraday process drives chemical changes. So, we could consider the Faraday process or Faraday reaction uh, as the chemical reactions. Let's go to the non-Faraday process. Here we have an electrode and here is the electrolyte. Right now I have applied some negative potential into the system or into the electrode. Then I have 10 negative charges which are developed uh, just beneath the surface of metal electrode. Then, how can we compensate the extra charges, or in this case, extra negative charges developed uh, within the electrode? Um, maybe you could expect that 10 cations are aligned just on the surface of the electrode. Then, you could compensate the extra negative charges developed in the side of the metal part. Okay, it's great. And actually, the 19th century scientist Helmholtz imagined like that. However, that is not true. In the real situations, we have some distributions of the charges to compensate the extra negative charges. We need to have cations, so you could find the cation distributions. Uh, let me make this situation more schematic. We have one, two, three layers. Maybe you could have more layers, like a fourth layer, fifth layer, or something like that. And in the first layer, you have one, two, three, four, five, five cations, and only single one anions. So the net charge of the first layer is four, four plus. Let me say we have 10 extra negative charges. So 40% of the 10 negative charges are compensated by the first layer. So potential is going up. And then let's go to the second layer inside of the electrolyte. In this second layer, you could find 1, 2, 3, 4 plus there and 2 minus there. So the net charge is 2 plus. 60% of um, the extra negative charges of electrodes is compensated up to the second layers. 
And then let's go to the third layer, 2 plus and 1 anion. So let's charge this 1 plus. So the summation of whole charges, whole uh, cationic charges are 7. So 70% of the extra negative charges developed in the electrode is compensated by using three layers of cations. Of course you have fourth and fifth, so the last of the extra charges would be killed by the other, more number of layers. That is the non faraday process. Of course, at the very first time, bef before you uh, did not apply any negative potential, then maybe um, the number of cations and uh, anions would be balanced for each electrode. If you have 5 plus and you should have 5 minus or something like that. However, after you have uh, applied a potential into the system, the cations and anions in electrolyte are rearranged and redistributed. So, in this way, we could compensate the extra charges by using the distribution of cations in this system. That is the non faradaic process. What is the most characteristic difference between faradaic and non faradaic process? In the faradaic process, electron is going from one country to the other country. North Korea, South Korea, or South Korea to North Korea. However, in the non faradaic process, the electron cannot go through the interface. It means there is no electron transfer. Um, the, the electrons of South Korea is just within the South. Actually, charge carriers, cations or anions. Uh, on the other hand, the electrons uh, of the North Korea is not going to the South Korea is a very sad history. Anyway, so minus C here and only cations are there. So there are no electron transfer through the interface. That is the characteristics of non faradaic process which is um, clearly um, distinguished from the faradaic process. Non faradaic process actually not lead to chemical change. So it's better to call this one as process instead of reaction. Electrostatic forces between different charges like some extra negative charges here and cations here is the driving force. And no electron can touch any species uh, in electrolyte, of course, in this situation. So, no electron transfer. I believe right now you could dis distinguish between Faraday reactions and non Faraday processes. Okay, then let's go to the uh, detailed picture of electric double layer here. And I have said the non Faraday process is the capacitive process of electric double layer based on electric double layer or the non faradaic process uh, can be said to be the process of electric double layer formation so let me think about the electric double layer as um, um, shown in the name electric double layer we have two layers for the electric double layers. The first one is called Helmholtz layer and the second um, layer is called diffusion layer. So here is the situation and uh, matter or electrode there and then I have applied some negative potential into the matter and inside of electrolyte you have sodium plus, Na plus and chloride minus in water. Then what happens on the surface of electrode? 
Okay, so our objective is to compensate the uh, extra negative charges developed just beneath the surface of electrode. Then maybe you could expect that the cations just on the surface of electrode, but it's not true. So let me think about that. Uh, here is the Helmholtz layer, and the other thing is the fusion layer. Helmholtz layer has two sublayers just on the surface, and the first layer you could find solvent molecules, solvent molecular layer, solvent molecules. Surprising, maybe you could expect that some cations are there to compensate the extra charge, extra negative charges of the electrode. But it is not true. Instead of cations, you will find the solvent molecules. In this case, water molecules. As you know, water molecule has its own dipole. Oxygen part has delta minus or negative partial charges and proton side has some uh, positive charges or uh, p plus delta. So when you apply some negative potential or negative charges into the electrode, the um, water molecules around the electrode is rearranged in this way. Their dipole mo moment is arranged toward the electrode. Actually, the direction of the dipole mom moment is plus to minus, so the dipole moment is rearranged uh, out of the plane of the electrode. So, this delta plus would compensate some portion of the extra negative charges of electrode. So, in this comp configuration, you could find some water molecules on the very, very first sublayer of Helmholtz layer. And in this pe picture, you could find one more thing. Uh, this one is so-called ghost ion, or specifically adsorbed species. For example, chloride minus is easily and strongly absorbed on, absorbed on metal surface. This is not related to electrochemistry. Based on chemical interaction, the chloride minus ions is strongly absorbed on the surface of electrode, so they could be found in the very first sublayer of Helmholtz layer. So we have two entities. The first one is water molecules or solvent molecules with it, uh, their dipoles rearranged. And the second um, uh, entities of the very first sublayer of Helmholtz layer is the specifically or strongly absorbed species. The plane uh, just uh, on, the, on the top of the solvent molecules is called inner Helmholtz plane, IHP. And then let's go to the second sublayer of Helmholtz layer. This uh, in the second sublayer, you can find solvated uh, counter ions, or in this case, case solvated cations. Here is the cation, sodium plus, I mean, and then water molecules. So, these solvated cations would compensate another portion of the extra negative charges developed on the uh, surface of electrode. So, that is the Helmholtz layer, which is responsible for about, let me say, 70% uh, of the extra charges of electrode. S 
then we still have 30 percent more so uh, let me uh, the diffuser layer uh, responsible for the 30 percent as you shown uh, in the previous slide we have some distribution of cations uh, the first layer uh, the imaginary first layer of the diffusion layer would have the very many uh, cations surrounded by water, molecule, water molecules. But the number of surveyed cations are decreasing with the uh, along with x-axis, far from the surface of electrode to the bulk concentration. So the last of 30% uh, of the extra charges are compensated by the diffusion layer. So, diffusion la in the diffusion layer, uh, distributed counter ions compensate the last of potential difference. That is the electric double layer. And here is very important comment. Electric double layers are always developed even without applied potential. Okay? And also even without any Faraday reactions. When a solid is immersed into a liquid, the reduction potential difference between the solid and the liquid drives the electric double layer formed. So you always find the electric double layer on the surface of electrode, even without any applied potential, even without any Faraday reactions. Right now, you have known the structure of electric double layer. But you would be very curious about why the first guy just on the surface of electrode should be um, solvent molecules or specifically adsorbed species instead of cations for a negatively charged surface of electrode. Why? Here is the answer. You know, here is the uh, structure of the electric double layer again. And you could find four players. The first guy is solvent molecules, water, and cations like sodium plus and anion, chloride minus, and specifically adsorbed species. Some X molecules are actually chloride minus could be specifically adsorbed species. Anyway, we have four players. And then let me compare the polarity and popularity of four players. Solvent molecules, its polarity or its interaction with the surface of electrode is weak because it is just based on the dipole. But popularity is really high. And let's go to the ions, cation and anion. Uh, both ions are very strong polarity and very uh, strong interaction with the surface, sometimes attractive, sometimes rep repulsive, depending on the sign of applied potential. However, the, their popularity is very low when compared with the number of solvent molecules. So, there is every possibility that the solvent, solvent molecule uh, is the very first guy just on the surface when you have an applied potential. Um, applied potential, okay. So, due to the popularity, solvent is the first guy when compared with cation and anion, even if it has the very low polarity. We need to think about one more guy, specifically adsorbed species. Polarity is really, really strong, or the interac interaction with the surface of electrode is very, very, very strong. It is not based on the electrochemistry. It is, the, it is based on the um, chemical interaction between the surface and the specifically adsorbed species. Very strong. However, popularity is uh, sometimes very low 
usually impurity molecules are absorbed on the surface of electrode. So very low. Even if its popularity is very low, the interaction between the specifically absorbed species and the electrode surface is really, really, really strong. So the first guy should be the specifically absorbed species. And almost in the same uh, time scale, or in the same position, you could find the solvent molecules because its popularity is really, really high. Also, as you know, popularity of specifically absorbed species is very, very, very low. So on the empty space on the surface of electrode, you could find the solvent molecules, of course. And then next thing is cations or sometimes anions. When you have a negatively charged surface, of course, you could find the cations, solvated cations, on the in the um, second sublayer of Helmholtz layer. So the um, order of the array is like that: absorbed species on the first guy, and then um, the solvent molecules who are in the same layer, then cations, then anions for the negatively charged surface electrode. Okay, uh, the, the catch phrase or the main sentence of this slide is that electric double layers can be modeled by capacitors. Before representing the electric double layers by using the capacitors, let me think about the capacitor. What is the capacitor? Right now, I have uh, two metal plate, left plate and right plate. Between them, you have some diapers like water molecules or sometimes a metal oxide or sometimes polymers. Then. I'd like to apply on potential. So on the left side of metal plate is charged, the, the, the positive charges are developed. And at the same time, uh, on the right plate, negative charges are developed. By um, the electric field formed between the positively charged plate and negatively charged plate, then the dipoles placed between those two plates are rearranged in the way like minus plus and minus plus. So right now, we could say some electrical energy is store, stored inside of the capacitor by uh, using the dipole arrangement between those plates. That is the capacitor. And why I am I saying that this capacitor could describe the electric double layer? Uh, first, let me focus on the Helmholtz layer. Uh, the, on the left side of the Helmholtz layer, you can find the electrode, the real electrode, uh, which is negatively charged right now. So let me take this electrode as the left plate of the very first capacitor. And then on the outer Helmholtz plane, you could find the cations, or, or an array of cations. Then let me take this plane as the right plate of a capacitor. Between those two plates, then you could find the dipoles that is the water molecules within found within the very first sublayer of Helmholtz layer. And also the solvating water molecules or solvate, solvent molecules sur surrounding the cations. Then you have some dipoles between those two metal plates, minus and plus. This is the capacitor. So Helmholtz layer could be described by 
the capacitor or capacitor. And then let me say this capacitor can be characterized by the capacitance. See? Capacitance of Helmholtz layer. Okay? And then let's go to the diffuse layer. Uh, let me think about the imaginary layers, sublayers within the diffuse layer. This is the first lay first sublayer of the diffuse layer, and this is the second sublayer, and third, fourth, fifth, or something like that. And along the x-axis from the electrode surface to the bulk region of electrolyte, the negatively charged the negative potentials are compensated more and more and more and more. Finally, uh, going to the potential of electrolyte. So, in this plane, in this plane, or in this sublayer, I, I I mean, let me compare the potentials between the uh, this first layer of the diffusion layer and this second layer. So, this is more negative than the uh, potential of the second layer. So let me take this plane as the left plate of the second capacitor and the third layer is going to the right plate of the second capacitor. So minus plus. In the same way you could set up the third capacitor, fourth capacitor and something like that. As you know the overall capacitance uh, could be calculated from the reciprocal summation when multiple capacitors are connected in series. So let me define some the the one a capacitor representing the diffusion layer and its capacitance calculated by this equation one over capacitance for the diffuse layer is equal to 1 over first capacitor, second capacitor, third capacitor, something like that. Then, right now, we have two capacitors, Helmholtz capacitor and diffusion layer capacitor. Of course, also, the overall capacitance of electric double layer could be calculated by this equation, 1 over C double layer, C equal to 1 over Helmholtz layer plus 1 over capacitance of diffusion layer. So we could represent the electric double layers by sometimes a single capacitor or sometimes two capacitors, sometimes one capacitor plus the an infinite number of capacitors. They all of capacitors are uh, connected in series. You have got the concept and also the structure uh, of the electric double layers. Then let's go to the content about how to measure the capacitance of electric double layers. Of course, you have, you have already learned about the measurement. You could use the voltammograms and chronoamperometry or chronopotentiometry for measuring the capacitance of the double layers. Here, I'd like to introduce more basic uh, measurements of the capacitance of electric double layers. This method is based on the electrocapillary effect. What is the electrocapillary effect? Here, I have a metal plate or electrode and then I have dropped a droplet of electrolyte. Let me say this electrolyte is the sodium chloride solution in water. So we would have sodium plus and chloride minus ions here and there. Also I'd like to assume that this situation is on the point of zero charge 
here, point of zero charge. It means we don't have any excess charges on the metal, and also there are no excess charges in the electrolyte, especially around the surface. So let me focus on the interface between the electrode and electrolyte. You have one, two, three, four, four positive ions, and also one, two, three, four, four negative ions. So the not net charge at the interface would be zero. So at the point of zero charge, I can say the excess charge density of matter and also excess charge density of solution, in this case electrolyte, should be zero. At the point of zero charge, cations plus here and anions minus here are homogeneously dispersed over the volume of the electrolyte droplet. Then the shape of the droplet looks like hemisphere, where if your liquid has very high surface tension, then sometimes your droplet looks like just a sphere. Then I'd like to apply a potential into the metal plate. What happens? Let's go to the second situations. Uh, in this case, I have applied a positive potential, which is more positive than the point of zero charge. It means we have the excess charge, which is larger than or which is more positive than zero. So right now, we have one, two, three, four, five, five plus charges in the metal plate. This excess charge would affect the ions inside of the electrolyte. So to compensate the five excess charges, uh, the sign of which are positive, then five negative ions or five anions are accumulated on the surface of the metal plate. So one, two, three, four, five. At the same time, the rest of negative, uh, negative ions or anions are going to the surface of the droplet due to the repulsive forces between negative ions. So, the anions are trying to go to the outside, sometimes to the surface of electrode and sometimes to the boundary, which is the interface between the liquid and the air. So this repulsive force would extend the spherical uh, shape of the, actually semi-spherical shape of the droplet is going to the uh, the shape of over like that. I mean the droplet is extended along the surface of metal plate. Metal plate. So the shape of the electrolyte droplet is changed. Like more in the more extreme cases, the sphere is going to like that. So. Let me think about the surface tension. This shape of droplet of electrolyte is indicating that high surface tension. However, after we applied a potential into the system, the surface tension was going down because the droplet is dispersed along the surface of electrode, it means surface tension is going down. Or wetting property was improved by applying a potential. Um, let me think about some situation. I mean, uh, let me apply uh, this electrocapillary effect to the mirror in the bath. You know, after hot showering, uh, hot shower, then you cannot see your face on the mirror clearly. 
because there are a lot of droplets with high surface tension on the meter. So light is dispersed by the droplet. However, if you could apply some potential, sometimes positive potential or sometimes negative potential, then the water droplets are dispersed along the surface of meter. Then finally, um, you could see your face clearly in the meter because the <coughs> droplet uh, shape is going to the like homogeneous film on the surface of meter. Okay, let me change some potential. In the second situation, I have the I have applied on um, positive potential, or also I could apply a negative potential. Then we could obtain this curve. Y axis is the surface tension, and x axis is the potential. So the surface tension is changing uh, with the potential. At the point of zero charge, the surface tension should be maximized. However, when we are going to the potential far from the point of zero charge, sometimes to the positive direction, sometimes to the negative direction, you are actually the the surface tension of your droplet or electrolyte would decrease in both directions. This curve of surface tension versus potential is called electrocapillary curve. And also this potential dependency of surface tension is called electrocapillary effect. The surface tension can be converted to the excess charge density and then it is going to the capacitance. So finally we could obtain the function of capacitance in terms of the potential. The surface tension can be converted to the excess charge density sigma by using Riemann equation. The first derivative of the surface tension in terms of the potential is going to minus excess charge of metal plate or plus excess charge of the solution. Then this excess charge is going to the capacitance. Capacitance is equal to charge per potential by definition. So we could easily obtain the capacitance values from the excess charge density. So let me think about the curves. The starting point was surface tension. So this is the electrocapillary curve. Surface tension and potential uh, at the point of zero charge, you would have the maximum uh, surface tension. However, when you are going to the potential far from the point of zero charge to the positive direction or to the negative direction, the gamma is going down on both sides. After uh, the Riemann equation conversion, this curve is going to the excess charge density versus potential curve. Of course, you could uh, could have this kind of graph by uh, obtaining some slopes of the first electrocapillary curves. And then one more conversion. Finally, we could obtain the capacitance. At the point of zero charge, I have said surface tension was maximized. And then when you have uh, applied a potential, then due to the repulsive forces between the same charges, then the, the surface tension is going down with your droplet uh, being extended along the surface. At the point of zero charge, 
capacitance is minimized, of course, because there are no excess charge. However, when you have increased the potential or decreased the potential, uh, your capacitance would increase with the potential. So, finally, we obtain the capacitance as a function of the potential. Then, right now, we recognize the relationship between the surface tension and capacitance. So, from the surface tension data, we could calculate the capacitance as a function of potential. For measuring the surface tension, uh, usually we are using the dropping mercury electrode as the working electrode. So finally, we could obtain the capacitance value of electrolyte. Here is the dropping mercury electrode apparatus. Here is the electrode, and actually that is the glass capillary. And this glass capillary is connected to the mercury reservoir. As you know, mercury is the liquid matter, so it is the conductor. And also it is liquid. So the mercury flows from the reservoir through the glass capillary and then finally going out of the glass capillary. So we could find some mercury drop. And this mercury reservoir is connected to the potential state or galvanostat or power supply. So electron can go through the mercury reservoir to the mercury drop. Here is the picture for the mercury drop. At the very first time, a mercury drop forms at the end of the capillary tube by gravity. So this is the formation step. Then the mercury drop grows continuously as mercury flows from the reservoir under the um, influence of gravity and has a finite lifetime of several seconds. So here, this is the growth step, and you could easily see that the size of the droplet is bigger than before. At the end of each lifetime, the mercury drop is dislodged while dropped, and then replaced by a new drop. So this uh, mercury drop is drop dropping in this stage. So we will use this mercury drop electrode. Here is the equation. The schemat schematic uh, uh, picture for the dropping mercury electrode is here. And of course, this is the capillary. And this capillary is connected to the mercury reservoir, even if it is not here. And then mercury is going down. Then here, uh, at the tip of the capillary, you could make some droplet. Of course, this electrode is immersed in some electrolyte. That is the situation. Then let's make some equations. Um, at the tip of the droplet of the mercury, we have two counterbalance counter forces. The first one is gravity force, and then the other thing is surface tension force. S um, the gravity uh, would make the droplet going down to electrolyte. However, the surface tension is trying to get together the mercury to keep the integrity. So the, d the direction of the uh, surface tension force is going up and gravity force is going down. So the uh, value of those forces should be the same. So surface tension force is equal to gravity force, where F gamma is equal to F gravity. F gravity is going to just mass by gravity, of course. How about the surface tension? The direction of surface tension is going along 
the surface of the droplet. That is to say, each direction is tangential to the surface of the droplet. So I'd like to extract the vertical component of this gamma or surface tension. So gamma prime is equal to gamma cosine theta. So this gamma prime is gamma cosine theta and the force is calculated by the product of gamma prime and the length of boundary of the interface between mercury, electrolyte, and capillary. That is to say, the uh, size of the uh, capillary is involved in this equation. So this boundary length is 2 pi r, and here r is the radius of the capillary. So the product of 2 pi r and gamma prime or gamma cosine theta is the surface tension per force. Then by reshuffling these equations, then gamma prime is expressed by mass gravity 2 pi the radius of capillary. In a fixed experimental setup, the R is constant, 2 pi constant, and of course gravity is constant. The mass is split into two terms. The first one is mass flux, and we could op uh, control the uh, mass flux value at constant. Then with the tau, tau is the drop time. That is to say, uh, after you recognize that M M prime where mass flux is constant, then you could know that gamma prime could be calculated by the falling time of mercury. That is to say, the falling time of mercury is a measure of surface tension. Longer uh, falling time means higher gamma or surface tension. Shorter falling time of mercury is going to the smaller surface tension. That is to say, high values of surface tension means mercury is trying to, uh, trying to get together. So it takes a longer time for falling. So by using these equations, you could easily calculate the value of surface tension. Okay, here is the real data of the electrocapillary curve. X-axis is the potential minus point of zero charge of sodium fluoride. And Y-axis is the gamma or surface tension. The unit of surface tension is force per centimeter. Then, uh, of course, um, dropping mercury electrode was used as the working electrode, and experimental temperature was 18 Celsius degree. And also, we have tested several um, sort, like uh, potassium iodide, sodium bromide, and potassium CNS, sodium chloride, calcium nitrate, and uh, potassium hydroxide. All of the curves looks like the normal, uh, the curves of capillary curve, expected from the previous slides. Around the point of zero charge, for respective sort, while electrolyte, uh, you should have the maximized value of the surface tension. However, Far from the point of zero charge, the surface tension is going down, sometimes to the negative direction, sometimes to the positive direction. For Ki, sodium bromide, KCNS, sodium chloride, or something like that. Um, some inter 
interesting things are discovered. For this curve, I mean for the negative potential, which is more negative than the point of zero charge, um, every source are going to the same curve. However, you can recognize that the curves are not um, coincident to each other uh, for the positive potential. Here is the reasons about that. At potential, more negative than point of zero charge. The capillary curves coincide to each other like that. Looks like on just one single curve. In this such situation, cation dominant electric double layer is developed. So you can find the cations here in the um, outer helmholtz plane. There are less effects of specifically adsorbed anions. Here is the uh, specifically adsorbed anions and the number of the adsorbed anions are not uh, such a large amount. So less effect of anions in this case because you have applied the negative potential into the electrode. There would be some repulsive forces. So statistically, similar number of anions could be ad adsorbed, specifically adsorbed or strongly adsorbed on the surface of electrode. So potential dependency of gamma or surface tension is independent of the identities of cations. I mean, there are no effect or very small effect of the adsorbed anions. And then the curve, capillary curve, going to a uh, single ideal curves. Let's go to the other side. At potential more positive than the point of zero charge, the ca capillary curves diverge markedly to each other like that. Ki here, sodium bromide there, KOH here, calcium nitrate there, something like that. In this situation, for the negative potential, an ion dominant electric double layer is developed like that. Uh, on the outer helmholtz plane, of course, you should find the anions. And also, on the surface of electrode, you have a lot of um, anions, which is specifically observed on the surface. Anions are suspected to be significantly observed on mercury. So this kind of non-ideality, then therefore the potential dependency of the surface tension depends on the identity of anions. Sometimes chloride minus ions are absorbed. Sometimes hydroxy ions are absorbed. Sometimes nitrate ions are absorbed. And the situation uh, became uh, different for each anion. So you have uh, various capillary curve in this region of potential, which is depending on the anions. However, in the cases of the <coughs> potential more negative than the point of zero charge, you have a very small number of anions. So it's not depending on, I mean, it doesn't, uh, I mean, the, there are no effects of the specifically observed anions on the surface. Another um, real research, this is the capacitance versus potential curves. Of course, this, it comes from the capillary curves. <coughs> uh, in this case, sodium fluoride is used on the mercury electrode at 25 Celsius degree. Also, 
uh, the concentrations are changed uh, from 0.01 molarity to 0.01 to 1.0 volt. At low concentration around the point of zero charge, for example 0.001 and 0.01 volt around here, the ideal electrocapillary behavior is shown. So at the point of zero charge, the minimum value of capacitance is obtained. However, when you are going far from the point of zero charge, then the capacitance is going up to the negative direction and also to the positive direction. However, even at low concentration, there is a deviation from ideality at potentials far from point of zero charge, like that, here and there. At high concentration, like 1.0 molarity, even the point of zero charge shifted to shifted from here, here to there, so to different value. Uh, this non-ideal non value, uh, the behavior is uh, suspected from that the dielectric constant and thickness of double layer changes changes with concentration. Capacitance can be described by the uh, dielectric constant per the thickness of double layer double layer, the thickness of double layer. So the cons the, the those two things, the electric constant and the double layer thickness could be a function of concentration. So we could have some change in the uh, curve of capacitance versus potential with concentration of even with the same identity of the salt or ions. For example, uh, XDL is the diffusion layer thickness and this is the function of the surface concentration. Oh, no, no, no. So the bulk concentration of sp electroactive, s uh, no, no, ionic species. It means XDL is inversely proportional to the root square of the concentration of ions. This is comes from Guichema model and we will learn about that in the following chapter. So in this table we have calculated the uh, diffuse layer thickness as a function of concentration. One molarity the thickness is just 3 Armstrong. However, when we are going to 10 to the minus 3 here, this is uh, about 100 Armstrong for the low, low values of the diffuse, diffuse layer thickness. <coughs> Therefore, the effects of concentration, the capacitance values are um, capacitance curve versus the potential could be changed. Anyway, at low concentration around the point of zero charge, you could get the ideal electrocapillary behavior. <coughs>